So this is our last lecture in a long chapter. We covered internal combustion engines, the gas turbines for power production. We talked about the combined cycle for electric generation. That would be the vapor power cycle and the gas power cycle. We talked about uh, gas turbines for propulsion, and the key idea was thrust. I'm going to touch on that again a little bit today. But we moved into compressible flow. Last time we talked about the speed of sound in any substance, got a general thermodynamic relation for that. And then for an ideal gas, the one we really use is the speed of sound in an ideal gas using constant specific heats that's approximated as the square root of K R T. That's a big equation used often. Then we talked about nozzles. We'll spend a lot more time talking about nozzles. When you get compressible effects and you start getting Mach 1 and above, you find some very interesting behavior. And let's jump into it. Here's a question on thrust. It'll be a clicker question. We have a jet engine. It's operating at steady state while on a test stand. So it's maybe running full power on a test stand. So here's my rendition of the jet engine. Here's my rendition of the test stand. All right. We'll say that the flow direction, here is the in, inlet air. Here is the outlet air going out. So that's the direction that the engine's being run. Full power on a test stand. All right. The test stand imposes a force on the engine. The test stand fails to hold the engine in place. Maybe when you get it up to full power, a bolt breaks or something. Shears, the test engine stand, the stand holding the engine stationary fails. Which direction will the engine begin to move if the stand fails? Will the engine move in the direction of flow? That's the direction of flow, answer A. Or will the engine lurch or move in the direction opposite of flow. So this is answer A, that's the direction of flow, or answer B. Hopefully that question makes sense. Let me let you answer it. This was a hard question, but I'm glad that a lot of us got it right. So which direction is it going to lurch or be flung when the engine stand fails to hold it in place? it'll shoot in the direction B. Correct? All right. Now, if you got that question correct, you're ready to solve the question that's in Wiley Plus. And this is the way it's framed in Wiley Plus. A jet engine operates at steady state while on a test stand. The test stand imposes a force on the engine in the direction of the flow or in the opposite direction of the flow. Again, here's my jet engine. Here's my inlet. There's my gases going out. That's the direction of flow. I have a test stand sitting here. The test stand imposes a force on the engine in the direction of the flow or in the opposite direction of the flow. Okay, before I grade that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back and I'm going to grade this one again. And I'm going to change up a little bit. The jet engine is operating at full power on a test stand. Okay, this is my test stand down here. Test stand. All right. The test stand fails to hold it in place. It's going to lurch. Which direction did we agree? B. Somebody says, Superman shows up to prevent the jet engine from slamming through the wall and killing thousands of people outside the building. Superman is going to grab a hold of the jet engine and push it that way. Or Superman's going to jump to action and push it that way. Answer A. Or answer B, this is my rendition of Superman. Which end? And you can only push on the engine. Ah, ah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh.
Why is that not 100%? Why are, why is that not 100%? They're outside, they're just clicking in randomly. Is that what it is? Who answered B that's in this room? Okay, nobody answered B that's in this room. All right, so what we got to do is we got to come back, and I'm going to re-ask this question. So, the test then imposes a force to hold the engine stationary while it's blasting away at 100% full power in the direction of flow or in the opposite direction of flow. Please answer this question. Oh, come on. People, come on, come on, come on. I've got to stop it. You should talk to your neighbors because some of you got it figured out. But let's grade this one. Hmm. Why is that not a higher percent? Look it. Isn't the force... Look, it, we said that the, the engine's going to lurch that way. That you had a high percentage. I think I have to put a force on the bottom of that engine, pushing it that direction to hold it stationary. True or false? Now, you're confusing. If I do a free body diagram of the test stand, what does it feel? That force. That's the direction of force it feels. But the engine feels the direction in the opposite, in the direction of the flow. So isn't the test stand imposes a force on the engine in the direction of flow? True? Do you agree? All right. Let's go back to question two. And some of you improved, but I was hoping that it would go really close to 100%, and it really didn't. Now, why do I bring this up? Because Wiley Plus grades the wrong answer correct. I'm trying to help you here. That's all I could say. So let's move into this topic. So we have a converging nozzle. And the converging nozzle, I'm, I shouldn't make it that big. Here's my converging nozzle. And we have a large section that supplies a constant pressure. I'm going to call that P naught. I'm going to call that the stagnation pressure because in that supply, it's stationary. But once it gets into the nozzle, it's flowing. It's starting to flow, and then it flows. And then it has the exit of the nozzle. So P naught, hey, that's stagnation. That's the terminology for that. We're going to talk more about the stagnation pressure. Then we're going to have the exit to the nozzle. We'll call that PE. And we can even talk about the pressure at the exit to the nozzle. And then the nozzle is going to dump out into a relatively large uh, after section. And that large after section, I know it's kind of funny, but the book uses this. And they put a humongous, how do you like that word, valve at the exit far away from the exit of the nozzle, but the exit of this chamber. Okay, and then outside you finally can dump it to uh, atmospheric pressure. Now, for the nozzle to work and to have the flow going in that direction, does the valve need to be open? Yes or no? Yeah, and does the P naught need to be greater than P atmosphere? Yes. So for, for the flow to flow in that direction, and yes, we're not going to do backward flow. For the whole lecture here, we're going to go, that's the direction of flow, okay? So don't try and make it confusing and have backflow in the nozzle. Okay, so we're going to talk about the uh, stagnation pressure that drives the flow. We'll talk about the pressure at the exit of the nozzle. We'll talk about the back pressure, which is not exactly the same as the atmospheric pressure. When the valve is fully open, completely open, guess what the back pressure equals? The outside atmospheric pressure. When the valve is completely, completely shut, closed, what is the back pressure? Equal to the stagnation pressure, the supply pressure. All right. So now what we do is we put a plot of the pressure 
as a function of distance, and the interesting part is in the nozzle from the inlet to the exit of the nozzle. And what we're going to do is we're going to take case A, and the valve is 100% closed. And then we'll do case B, the valve is like 90% open. And then case C, we're going to do some increasing open, open, open of the valve. All right, so that's, that's our case A, B, C. Can you sketch what the profile of the pressure looks like, starting with P naught? Hey, I forgot. What is that P naught name? Pressure. Uh, what is that? Stagnation pressure. Stagnation pressure. Um, does it go like this? Does it go like this? Does it go like this? When the valve is completely closed. It's a straight flat line. And in that case, the exit pressure is equal to the stagnation pressure, and the back pressure is equal to the stagnation pressure. That's a big accomplishment. We, we have done well. What's on this X axis right here? It's the location where you're making the pressure measurements. Somewhere out here is the location you know, of the chamber called the back back pressure location. Here is the exit and here is the inlet and we'll call that the stagnation location. Okay, now let's say I open the valve a little bit, I get a little bit of flow. Well, guess what happens to the back pressure? It drops a little. So this is for case A, this is for case B, and it basically is not changing this huge chamber and so the exit pressure is equal to the back pressure. And then you have some sort of change back up to the stagnation pressure. We're always starting at the stagnation pressure. And then we open it some more, case C. Then we open it some more, case D. This is case D. This is case C. All right? But guess what happens is you, let's say case D is a very special case such that the flow, if I was looking at the speed right in here, it's gotten to be Mach 1. If it's Mach 1 in the throat of that nozzle, the smallest area of that nozzle, it's what we call choked. So I'm going to say right here it's choked. Let's say you open the valve even more. Well, what's happening to the back pressure? It drops. But can I get flow any faster than the speed of sound in the exit? No, you're constrained. So it won't be a match of the pressure. Just a little bit on the outside of the exit, there will be a little reduction in pressure across an oblique shock. Shock. Some shock. So I forgot to emphasize, all of this flow is isentropic except for when you have a shock. The shock, you're going to have irreversibilities across that shock. Let's say this is case E, and let's say you open the valve more. There's case F. Well, the back pressure goes down. What increases in intensity? The shock and the pressure drop across that shock. All right. What we do is they also have a plot that is uh, try to line this up too of the, the pressure, no, the mass flow rate, this is a hard plot to digest. The mass flow rate as a function of, and I'm going to try and put it so it doesn't line up with E, the pressure difference, okay, the pressure ratio, not the pressure difference, the pressure ratio. So the first pressure of interest will be the, uh, the back pressure divided by the pressure, the stagnation pressure. Okay, this is one. This is a hard plot to plot because actually you start by putting a point here and not over at the origin. You know, a lot of times in mathematics you have a nice line that goes through the origin or something, right? And then they, they shifted it and then now it intersects the y-axis somewhere other than the origin. The, you know, that was a, a step that was hard to follow as a student. Here what we're doing is starting a line way out here on the x-axis at y equal to zero at this location where the back pressure is equal divided by the stagnation pressure equal one 
tell me about which of these cases, A, B, C, D, or E, is this first point matching? Point A. Point A. So there's my case A. Now, if I move to case B, what happened to my back pressure? It's a little less than the stagnation pressure. So point B is going to be in this direction, going that direction on the x-axis. What about the mass flow rate? Well, it started with a mass flow rate of zero, but now I'm going to have some flow through it. And so it's like this is location A, this is location B. Where do you think location C is? C is that way. So you're kind of plotting going this way. It's all backwards, right? It's hard to follow. All right. And then you're going to get up to case D. What's special about case D? What happened in the throat? It was choked. All right. When we went to E and F, what was the pressure at the throat? It was our choked flow. It was the, that pressure. Did it drop anymore even when we went to E and F? No. Did the pressure profile in here change anymore? I mean, E and F have the same pressure profile in the interior of that converging nozzle. It's just what happened a little bit after the exit of that nozzle that changed between D, E, and F. So what happens is, is the mass flow rate's maxed out. You, know, you can try and push more air through it, but guess what? It isn't going. So what's controlling it? It's like choked flow. Is that's It's limiting the mass flow rate. This is a very interesting plot, isn't it? Because here would be case E, here would be case F. D, E, and F have all the same mass flow rate. All right. There's another plot of interest. Maybe I'll just uh, jump here. Because if you're reading the book, all I did was reproduce this plot. First of all, I tried to reproduce this diagram. That's a hard diagram to understand because what is this? It's a huge valve. doesn't make much sense. Okay. Then I tried to reproduce this plot. That's hard. Then I tried to reproduce this plot, and you got to go this way to understand it, I think. That's the easiest way to understand it. The other one is you look at the, uh, the pressure back divided by the, I'm sorry, pressure exit divided by the stagnation pressure, compared to the ratio of back pressure to the stagnation pressure. It's a one-to-one -one going down from unity and unity until what? And then it's piastric. It's the same pressure in the throat. It's pi What is piastric? It's where the throat is, and it's choked. All right. Huh. Supersonic flow, air flowing isentropically, okay, all of our flows except for when there's a shock. So all of our flows are going to be isentropic. Through a converging nozzle, that's the only thing we've studied so far, the cross-sectional area is getting smaller for the flow, it's converging nozzle, can achieve supersonic flow at the exit. What does supersonic mean? Mach number less than one? No, that's subsonic. Mach number equal to one. No, that's sonic. Mach number greater than one, like 1.25, 1.5, 2.0, that's supersonic. So air flowing isentropically through a converging nozzle can achieve supersonic flow at its exit. True or false? in a converging nozzle. We're going to get to the converging diverging in a second. Let's go ahead and take a look at our results. And so there is no way you can get supersonic flow in a converging only nozzle. So it's false. Who did C? Somebody's not even. You were trying to hit B and then you got a C. Sorry. I did. I didn't count it right. Oh, he, oh, okay, there, you, he, your friend down here wants you to get it. <laughs> now that's going to be the, hey, excuse me, I clicked E, but I really now know that I wanted. So uh, I believe it's a French engineer or French scientist named De Laval, De Laval, uh, studied this and was the first, and so they attach his name to a nozzle in which you can get 
supersonic flow. And so if you just have a converging section and that's it, you cannot get it any faster than the speed of sound. But if you then couple it, and who would have been crazy enough to think about it? Most people would have said, boost the pressure, try harder, try harder, right? After you're studying for your final exam, you've been studying for 12 hours straight, they say, okay, this is a recipe now for getting a better grade on your study 14 hours straight. Oh, study 16 hours straight, 24, 36 hours study marathon, forget sleep. That's the best thing you can do to, to improve your grade on a final exam. No. Anyway, uh, this is the concept I would have fallen for. I would have said, boost the pressure. Boost the pressure, really. Force it through to make it go faster. Somehow, they said, no, try this. Open it up. What? You open it up, it's a diffuser. It's going to slow it down. Au contraire. If it's choked flow right in here, guess what it's going to do? It's going to go faster now. This is the craziest stuff out there. This really is crazy. So anyway, genius, incredible genius. It's called the converging diverging nozzle, the CD nozzle or the De La Ball nozzle. How old is this? I don't know. It's old though. Yeah. So now what we do is we do the same thought experiment. We have our big back pressure control to a chamber. We have the uh, a nozzle that is converging. And then what we do is we have a diverging section. And then we have the, the stagnation or uh, control pressure back here. The stagnation pressure is constant. Right in here, what do they call that section? The minimum area? They call it the, the throat. Yeah, the throat. And so what we're going to be interested in is a plot of the pressure as a function of location, especially going in the converging section, hitting the throat, and then the diverging section, and then coming at the exit of the nozzle where it then exits into a larger chamber. And that larger chamber is controlled, that pressure is controlled by this valve, so it's a back pressure. So the easiest thing is case A, what is the valve? Fully closed. Fully closed, you have a high stagnation pressure, so it starts out P naught, and there it is, pretty unexciting. What is the exit pressure? It's equal to the back pressure. All right, that's case A. Now, case B, if you had fluid mechanics, great. If you had a good physics class, great. If not, well, then you learn about Venturi's. This is Venturi meter, basically, what we're going to reproduce. So what happens to the flow? It starts to flow through it, and the back pressure is equal to the exit pressure, and you have a dipping down and then a recovery. I shouldn't have drawn it so low. I should leave it way up here. Where is the lowest pressure in my converging, diverging nozzle? It's in the throat. This is how... Uh, if you're doing a paint spray, you have an air paint sprayer gun, right? This is how a lot of um, misting or spray systems work. If you have a garden hose, it works in water. You're wanting to spray a herbicide on a plant or some other thing. You hook it up with a little siphon tube coming up to the, basically, the venturi location or the lowest pressure, and then it'll suck it up. Hopefully you, that resonates with you. You've seen it in your life, this application. Anyway, you continue to drop A, B, C. You're going to get to D. So what happens at case D is you get the lowest pressure. It's the P asterisk that you can get at that location where it's now choked flow. It's uh, Mach 1 in the throat. And if you had uh, the low... The, back pressure low enough, it would just gradually recover back out to the back pressure. So the exit pressure would be the back pressure. But if you pull on it just a little lower, what will happen is it will then start to go and get lower pressure as it goes into this diverging section of the nozzle. Now, if that's if you go a little below D with case E. But what happens with this one is you get what they call a normal shock in the in the the diverging section of the nozzle and then it'll be subsonic 
and it'll come out with the exit pressure equal to the back pressure. Okay, so what do we have right here is you have a section that is supersonic. Then what happened? You have a shock, normal shock. And across that shock, you have a pressure boost. And then the rest of the diverging section of the nozzle is just like what you anticipated. It's subsonic flow and it's slowing down and there's a pressure recovery. Well, you continue with case E and then F. And then that moves that normal shock further down until you can get it with a special case, the normal shocks right at the end. What happens is you drop the pressure more on the back pressure. Well, the normal shock can't travel outside. It becomes a different type of shock. It becomes a oblique shock. Then you can actually have it where you get just a perfect no shock. Or you get a different oblique shock. Instead of the oblique shock with the pressure gain, you have a oblique shock with a pressure drop across the shock. Okay, that's a lot of craziness to digest. But the big thing is if you want the flow to go faster than, than the speed of sound, you can make it happen with a converging, diverging nozzle. And then you have to start worrying about shocks. This is the plot I tried to reproduce. The normal shocks located, they have the normal shocks moved to the special case where it just recovers to the back pressure. Then I have an oblique shock with a pressure increase, the special case I where it's just perfect, no shock, and then oblique shock with a pressure drop. There's a lot that can happen on the exit. This is the stuff NASA is interested in because you push stuff out in space. So we're going to develop this red equation. Okay, well, what's that? It's a very important equation. It doesn't look that important, but it's very important. Where does it come from? Conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and the second law for isotropic flow, and you combine these. So here they're taking the mass and momentum and combine, no, isentropic flow and momentum to make a combined or modified momentum. Then with the mass, you get this crazy equation. Look at the terms in the equation. Big M, what do you think that is? Mach number. Big A, area. Big V, speed, velocity. Now, this is how the area changes, a little change, and this is how the velocity changes. And we're always interested in moving X in that direction, little DX. They could have written it with the DX, they don't. All right. This is that same equation written this way, or you can rewrite it this way. Okay, well, if you rewrite it this way, what do I have here in the numerator? I have how the area changes compared to the current area. So if dA is negative, what's happening to the nozzle? It's going smaller and smaller. It's converging, converging. This is a case right here. dA is negative. Also, over here, isn't this dA equal to negative? All right. Now, what you can do is do this. You have Mach number squared minus 1. We're going to consider subsonic flow. What's subsonic? Mach less than 1. If I put in Mach less than 1 in this equation, what does this term do? It stays negative. It stays negative. Then we're going to consider supersonic, Mach number greater than 1. What does this term do? It's positive. So I know this is kind of crazy, but over here for subsonic flow, you could almost rewrite it to say that dV over V is equal to minus um, uh, whatever, a constant times dA over A. It's whatever the actual Mach number is. Okay, determines that constant. But look at if I if I have a decrease in the area, A is always, there's never going to be a case of A is negative. It's always positive, isn't it? And likewise, V is always positive. Don't try and do backflow. 
it's always down in that direction, out the, the, in this, as shown in all of these arrows. Okay, so here what you do is you take a look and you say, well, what is dV? How is the velocity changing? It's going to be a positive V times a negative constant times uh, a negative dA. The negatives, negative, make it all, you're going to speed up. This is going to speed up, right? Speed up, meaning dV is positive. If you do it for the same equation, for the diffuser where the area is expanding, it'll slow down. dV is negative. Take the same equation now, Mach number is greater than 1. This makes this term positive, which makes it very counterintuitive. So if my let my area become smaller, it doesn't go faster, it slows down. This will slow the flow. And if I let the area get bigger, it won't slow down, it will speed up. And so it, the supersonic diverging section acts as a nozzle. Nozzles speed things up. Okay. Uh, professor, can you show me the derivation of that equation? Well, the NASA slide just said take this one equation, modify it with this equation, modify it with this equation. Well, here it is. Enough? Uncle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about stagnation temperature and stagnation pressure. Let's uh, be a little more formal. All these are reference state temperatures. They don't have to physically exist in our system. So the, what you have is a conservation of energy statement. Do you recognize that? You're thinking, I'm going to have the flow at a given temperature, hence I'll have a given enthalpy, and a given kinetic energy, and think about having brought it completely to rest such that there's no kinetic energy term. It's just a stagnation at rest enthalpy. That equation look like a good equation for conservation of energy? Yes. Okay, rearrange it, introduce constant specific heats, and then solve for the stagnation temperature. It's the physical actual temperature plus one half V squared over C sub P. Recall, we're going to use that in a minute right here. Recall, what is uh, Mach number? So the speed is Mach number times the uh, um, speed of sound, speed of sound square root of KRT. So V squared is K. R T M squared, and now you can expand. So T naught is equal to the one half V squared. You replace by this, and you recall this. Nobody recalls that property relationship, except for maybe the instructor. The students aren't gonna, but you know, you work through it, and that you can re convince yourself that yeah, C sub P is K times R divided by K minus one, and voila, you derive that equation. That equation doesn't look very intuitive, does it? Let's use that equation. Air traveling at 200 meters per second. At a temperature, so this is V is equal to that, temperature of 335 Kelvin and a pressure of 800 kilopascal. The corresponding stagnation temperature, that's T naught, is equal to something less than T, of 335 or equal to T of 335 or greater than T. What equation am I going to use? That equation as a reminder I will give you a few seconds to answer. So basically this is like saying that stagnation temperature is less than the actual temperature stagnation temperature is equal to the actual temperature or the stagnation temperature is greater than the actual temperature, right? That's the same question, right? And so you can see that uh, the stagnation temperature is the physical temperature times something, right? All right. Um, this could be, it, it's always one plus something. So 
if, if this was going to be, let's say, 0.9, then it's a 1 plus a negative 0.1, right? That's how you would get 0.9, negative 0.1, right? Uh, or if this was just 1, it would be 1 plus 0. Or if it was 1.1, it would be 1 plus a positive 0.1, right? Uh, I'm going to re-ask that question. You get If you get it right two times, you get twice the points, see? So we go ahead and stop. We take a look at the results, and good job. Look at that. And then, not bad, but I moved a few of these A's and B's over, right? Now, if you wanted to, you could do the calculations. I know some people are like, oh, I'm giving this speed. I need to get the Mach number so I can compute this, put it in here. Well, here it is. There's the speed of sound, and yes, 200 divided by this gives you a Mach of 0.54, and then you throw it in here. And about this time, you're probably thinking to yourself, boy, did I just waste a lot of time. Like, there's no way. There's no way, right? It's, it's always one point something, 1.059, blah, blah, blah. Stagnation temperature is going to be higher than the actual temperature. As you speed up, it basically is lower temperature. Okay. You can get the stagnation pressure. Uh, here is a way to do it. Use the result from the stagnation temperature, which you worked so hard to get. And recall that it's always isentropic. Stick in there, and voila, even though that equation looks very abstract, it's derived in two lines. I didn't say this was very intuitive, is it? It's very mathematical. Compressible flow is very mathematical. Guess what? You can also get something for this A asterisk. What is A asterisk? Well, that's your choked flow area. And so the actual area to the choked flow area is given by this complicated equation with Mach numbers, etc. Now, how did they start? What is the starting equation to derive this area equation for the physical divided by the choked flow area? What does this equation look like right here? It looks like a conservation of mass. So m dot is equal to m dot. So this would be the m dot at some arbitrary location where it's not choked to the m dot that's in the throat, where this is the density in the throat, this is the um, area of the throat, and guess what that is? That's the speed of sound in the throat because the velocity in the throat. Now, this is the four-letter word that, well, you know, it's a lot of work. It's in the textbook. So what I'm going to do is say you take those three equations and you can play with Mach number, assuming constant specific heat for air, ideal gas, and you can plot out and tabulate T over T naught. Wasn't that our first equation? P over P naught, our second equation, and then A over A asterisk, our third equation. It's a little complicated because this, why don't they put A over A naught? No, it's, that doesn't make any sense. It's A asterisk. It's the choked um, the throat area. And what do they do here? Well, what's the Mach number of zero? Stagnant flow. What's the Mach number of one? Choked flow. And this is all supersonic and all subsonic. And this table it has one special number in it that everybody that studies compressible flow knows. And so I challenge you, if you say, see somebody like Professor Johnson, Professor Combs, or Dr. Basu, you basically come up and say, what's 0.528 mean to you? And it'll start on a very long discussion about the importance of 0.528. It's like a grade schooler comes up to you and says, tell me a little bit about 3.1. 141.59. You would launch into a long discussion about pi, wouldn't you? Sure. Well, they're going to launch into a long discussion about this number and the importance of this number. So, what do we have here? Let me try and describe it. P divided by P naught is equal to 0.52828. First of all, we don't like that many digits. Let's round it off to one significant digit. What is that number rounded off to? 0.5. So P is equal to 0.5 of P naught. When? M is 1. So if I have a nozzle like this, 
and I have enough pressure here, a high enough stagnation pressure, what can you tell me about the exit pressure right there, about half? And then if, if I come out here and I have the atmospheric pressure, which is about 15 PSI, I know 14.7, 15 PSI, or 100 kilopascal, if you want to work with kilopascal. Basically, I can get choked flow, Mach 1 flow right here, M equal to 1, in the converging nozzle, and then afterward, I'm going to get a squiggly line indicating a rapid pressure decrease or a shock. So there's many examples of this. The easiest one is a tire, air tire, a pneumatic tire, and you have the valve stem. How many people have ever checked the air temp pressure in their tire, right? Okay. Now, any people you have overpressurized, you have to little, let a little air out. So you turn the pressure you know, gauge over. It has a little protrusion. You probably never notice that, but it's supposed to press in on the Schrader valve to let a little air out. And now bear with me if you've had this class before, or whatever, but how do you know when you depress it if air is coming out? You only have a few senses. You can either smell it, you can see it, you can put your tongue down there and taste it, you can, or, you know, put your nose, or you can hear it with your ear. Now, what's your intuition say? You hear it. What are you hearing? You're hearing a loud rush, and basically it's a shock coming out. Now, after a while, let's do this. Let's say that the tire pressure was at 40 PSI, and you wanted to take it down to 30 PSI. Is that 40 PSI gauge or absolute? Gauge, which means it's absolute is 40 plus 15, is about 55 PSI. 55 PSI absolute. All right. After a while, you let it out, let it out, let it out. It'll stop making a large hissing noise. It'll start to not be choked flow with a little shock in there, right? Uh, basically, when does that happen? When the pressure is less than half. So we know that this exit pressure would be about the atmospheric pressure or less when you don't have any more choked flow. So if this is 15 PSI, I need the tire pressure to be roughly 30 PSI A, 30, I can write 30, 30 PSI A or 15 PSI G. So once you're down, down below about 15 PSI G, do you hear a loud rushing, hissing sound? No, you don't. <coughs> So now these equations are all based on isentropic flow. Do we really perfectly have isentropic flow? No, but our equations are useful in predicting what we observe in nature and in, in, in applica engineering applications. There's a lot of other applications of this, but this number, I challenge you, you go find, so, oh, you're an aero professor, you got your degree. You're teaching in mechanical engineering, I know, but you're an aero professor, right? Okay, now, what's 0.528 mean to you? And then get ready. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna launch off into a great discussion. A converging nozzle has a stagnation pressure of 1,000 kilopascal, P naught stagnation pressure. <coughs> if the back pressure, it's only a converging nozzle, is 850 kilopascal, the exit pressure would be, so here we go, our nozzle. We're interested in the pressure at the exit. There's our exit. Then we open back up to our back pressure. Okay, the back pressure is given, 850 kilopascal. What is that exit pressure for this converging nozzle? We don't have a lot of time, so guess. Or talk to your friend that's really smart. Not too long, it's really So let me pick it up here. We'll shut it down. And uh, this is a little complicated the way you would go about answering it. You would say, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume the exit pressure is the, the back pressure, right? All right, uh, which basically says that the flow is subsonic through that converging nozzle. 
And uh, then the lowest pressure would be the exit pressure because this is the stagnation pressure back here at 1,000 kilopascal. Therefore, at the exit, the, the exit pressure is uh, divided by the stagnation pressure is 0.85. We go to our table or our equation, either one. Let's come over here to our table. It's a little easier to see. And where is our P exit over P naught of 0.85? Uh, somewhere in this vicinity. So you're somewhere in a Mach number of? Or you can look at the equation and make the same observation. You find the Mach number is around half, so it's coming out of that nozzle subsonically. Guess what? We conclude, yeah, uh, that back pressure is. I know it's kind of some uh, silly. You assume and then you conclude. You agree with your original assumption. But guess what? After we grade this, um, hey, you're pretty smart. Uh, we're going to change it up. What do you think the nasty professor does to the same problem? Drops a zero. Instead of having a back pressure of 850, a back pressure of 85 kilopascal. A lot lower back pressure. Now you get to answer the same question. Everybody in? All right. Uh, yeah, this is really, uh, I hate to say it, I'm rushing through a lot of material. I wish I could go slower, but I can't. Um, hey, what is uh, 0.528? Hey, what was that favorite number that the, yeah, when it's choked flow, right? 0.528, wasn't that the P over P naught? And if I take that and multiply it by 1,000, because uh, that's P naught, what number do I see over here? So, I know that's a terrible, terrible, but let me go through how you answer it. How you answer it is you say, I'm going to assume that the exit pressure is the back pressure. I'm going to assume it's 85 and then see if I conclude that, yeah, I agree with myself or if there's a contradiction. So, it basically assumes all the flow is subsonic throughout the nozzle, even at the exit. So, the lowest pressure is at the exit. Therefore, at the exit, P exit divided by P naught is exit pressure is equal to the back pressure. That was our assumption. It's 85.085. We go to the table, 9.2 or the equation. All that table does is plot the equation. 0.085, you have to remember that number. We look for 0 0.085, 0 0.085. Okay, I have to come out. For my exit pressure to be uh, 0 .85, 0 0.085 of the stagnation pressure, I have to come out at 2.2 something Mach. So uh, I conclude that it's around 2.25, just eyeballing it. So I would have to have the supersonic nozzle. I'd have to have a nozzle that allows converging and diverging. But what type of nozzle was I given? Only. Only a converging nozzle. Can a converging nozzle exit with the 2.25 Mach number? No. But it can't be supersonic. So you conclude there will be some sort of a shock at the exit, such that there's this drop from the exit pressure to the actual back pressure. A big difference between the exit pressure and the back pressure. You conclude that the flow would be Mach 1. It would be choked. And uh, you do the math there, and uh, the best answer is A. I don't even like asking that question because it's terrible, isn't it? Isn't that a, sometimes you feel like you're just being lectured to, and then you're, it's like a fight, and the, and the instructor's just punching you below the belt. <laughs> it's like a nasty fight. Yes, come on, that's not even a fair question. Well, I wish I had more time. But in the interest of time, I'm going to say you should solve a problem like this, which if you understood the previous two problems, you'll be able to solve it, okay? And here you have converging, diverging, and yes, you can get a Mach number greater than, let's say this is exit state two, greater than one with a converging, diverging nozzle. Here's the full worked out solution if you want to take a picture of it. It's fine. You you can, you can't. 
All right? Anybody? You're okay? I know I don't have enough time to fully work that, so that's why I'm skipping it, but I do want some more to cover. First of all, I'm going to say this was one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging topic or chapter in the entire textbook, in our entire class. So whenever you see something about shocks in this section 9.13.3, 9.14.2, skip it, skip it, skip it, skip it. We just want to emphasize that, yeah, okay, now there's going to be a shock, but I don't want to analyze it. The book does more in the analysis of the shocks. Just skip the analysis of the shocks. Key concepts. Remember, we started this chapter, mean effective pressure, air standard analysis, auto, diesel. Wow, that was a long time ago. But then Professor rushed through this last section, compressible flow, momentum, velocity of sound, Mach number, subsonic, supersonic, stagnation state, stagnation pressure, temperature, choke flow, normal shocks, oblique shocks. There's a lot of topics that I kind of rush through. I just expose you to it because if you're really interested, not only can you take an undergrad class, compressible flow, that's offered this semester right now. That means you're not enrolled in it, but probably in the spring of 2020, it'll probably be, it, we like to recycle these about once a year, once every uh, year and a half. And probably Basu will be around and he'll teach it. And believe me, it's a whole, whole class, compressible flow. A lot of nozzles, okay? And he'll spend a lot more time and you'll develop. Also, for the fall, if you're interested, if you have a 3.0 plus GPA, you're nearing graduation, you could take a graduate class for credit. Graduate class. Remind you, when you get close to graduation, if you see a class like that that really excites you, then you can enroll in it. Uh, so that's a little bit of a stretch. But next semester, we mentioned that we have internal combustion engines, undergrad class. That's the beginning part of Chapter 9. So I'm trying to sell these classes as technical electives. With that, I thank you for your attention. And I'll see you next time.